Well, shalom, shalom. I want to welcome everyone to the New Moon Conference Call. Uh, this is the first day of the 11th month for us, and this is 2019. Uh, this is Barbara, and I'm serving as your host today, and also if Brother Pete agreed to help me with hosting today. And I just want to welcome all our family and friends that are here on the Internet and on the phone. You are my family. And I want to welcome the others that are maybe listening to this recording. Uh, we invite everyone to go to the website, LunarSabbathDay.com, and it uh, tells a, a lot about the Creator's Calendar. There's articles there, videos there, and always you can go to the events page and scroll down to the bottom. It tells you the dates that we meet. You're welcome to come and worship with us on Sabbath and New Moon Days, and it tells our phone number and Internet connection. So we would like to connect with you. We're so happy for this fellowship time that the Father has given us. And uh, today our topic is going to be about the 29- and 30-day month. Uh, and sometimes that's hard, uh, confusing maybe if you're new to the Lunar Sabbath or the Creation Calendar uh, that it's not always a perfect 30-day month. Uh, in the time of Israel, it was always a 30-day month. And we know that all the prophecy in the Bible and all that is uh, all by 30-day months. And uh, so um, that's the calendar that Israel had. But there's been a little dent in the calendar. So now we sometimes have 29-day months and sometimes 30. So is it possible that it was because of Hezekiah and the sundial. So uh, this is a study. You can uh, take uh, what you can glean from it and uh, leave the rest. Uh, we invite everyone to study for their self. This is an article uh, written uh, by this uh, uh, show, uh, I guess his name is Joshua Eliu. And it's Hezekiah, the sundial of Ahaz, and the 20 and 30 day month. This article is on our website, lunarsabbathday.com. Go to the article page, scroll all the way down close to the book section, and you'll see the complete article, and you can read it for yourself. So uh, we're going to go through some of it today. It's only eight pages, but well, there's some math in here. There's a lot of interesting things. And um, this uh, Elihu, he did a pretty good job. We have presented this one other time on the conference call. It's been a couple of years ago. So um, let's see. Let's see. I'm not familiar with the Hebrew name. The brother Pete, do you want to read That's that scripture? Malachim Bet, which is Second Kings 20, Thank you. 9 through 10. And Hezekiah, and Hezekiah answered, It would be easy for the shadow to go down ten degrees. No, but let the shadow return backwards ten degrees. End quote. The above verse has always been looked at as a ot or sign from Yahweh to just one sick man who just happened to be Malek, that is, king of Israel, that Yahweh would heal him. But is that all there is to know? Is there more hidden here than meets the eye? Let's dig deeper into Yahweh's word and see what can be uncovered. We know from Bereshit, that is Genesis 1.14, that Yahweh's calendar is the sun, moon, and stars. Open quote. And Yahweh said, let there be lights in the firmament of the Shamaim to divide day." from the night, and let them be for signs between Yahweh and Israel, and for Moyadim, all of Yahweh's appointed times, and for days and years, end quote. <clears throat> so if the sun and moon is Yahweh's calendar, and it is, what would happen if the sun moved from its original place, such as was the case in Malachim Bet, that is 2 Kings 29-10, Shadow returned backwards 10 degrees, end quote. First, we must understand, for the sundial shadow to return backwards 10 degrees, the sun would have to return backwards from its 
its okay. original, its current location at that time of the day to where it was 10 degrees earlier. I will explain why it must be that the sun moved and not the earth rotating backwards later on. Okay. And so I'll scroll up and see how much time is 10 degrees. And this is this man's uh, thoughts on it. Uh, and so it's interesting to study. So how much is 10 degrees? Yes, I am. I'm doing as much as I can. Now there is also an argument that these 10 degrees were 10 hours, similar to what we, uh, what was in use, according to history, in the Babylonian step sundials around the same time period. This is simply not possible. And I'm sure some of you will be asking, well, why not? Malachim Beth, that is 2 Kings 29, quote, and Yeshua said, this is the ot or the sign you have of Yahweh that Yahweh will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forth 10 degrees or go back 10 degrees, end quote. So how does this verse prove it could not be 10 hours? Yahweh gave Hezekiah a choice, either 10 degrees forward or 10 degrees back. Now we all know that there are not 20 hours of daylight in one day in Eretz, Israel, that is the land of Israel, <clears throat> it is similar to the hours of daylight which we have in the United States. In midsummer, we have about 13 or so hours of daylight on the longest days. So if this verse means 10 hours or steps, and even if it's exactly midday when the sun was directly overhead when this occurred, Hezekiah would not have been able to see the shadow move 10 hours forward or backwards. He would have only been able to see six or seven hours at most in either direction, as if the daylight was even, say, 14 hours total from sunrise until sunset. And if it were the seventh hour of the day, or exactly when the sun was directly overhead, high noon, by Roman timekeeping, Hezekiah would only have been able to see the shadow move seven hours forwards or backwards. That alone proves that the ten degrees could not be ten hours. As if he would not have been able to see it move ten hours forward or backwards, why would Yahweh have given him such a choice? Also, why would Hezekiah bother looking at the shadow of the sundial to move ten hours of time in just moments the sun would have really been doing some moving, and it would have been quite an evident without bothering to look at the sundial. <clears throat> Note further that Yahweh dictated exactly how many degrees of change, which was 10 degrees forward or backwards. He did not leave that up to Hezekiah or any other man. I'll explain why later on. <clears throat> So we now come back to how much time was this 10 degrees. As we know, people still use sundials even today, although mostly just for recreational and, quote, scientific purposes. It is a known fact that for most of the Earth, not including North and South Poles, 15 degrees on a sundial is equal to one hour. So if Hezekiah's sundial returned backwards 10 degrees, that would mean the shadow moved backwards two-thirds of an hour, as 10 is two-thirds of 15. And if 15 degrees is equal to one hour, that would mean 10 degrees is also two-thirds of an hour, which is 40 minutes. Okay. So he's saying, I'll just put my little math head, he's saying 10 degrees is 40 minutes. It wouldn't be possible to be uh, 10 hours. Uh, it would have taken too long. So this is uh, 40 minutes, 10 degrees. And here's the math. Simply put, 15 degrees equals 15 degrees. <laughs> 10 degrees equals 10 degrees. That's listed there. <laughs> uh, and then he has a table explaining that 10 degrees is two-thirds of 15 degrees. Uh, therefore, this is also true. If 15 degrees is equal to an hour, then
then 10 degrees is 40, uh, 40 minutes or two thirds of an hour. Okay, since we know now that 10 degrees equal 40 minutes, that means Hezekiah's sundial shadow returned backwards 40 minutes. I know what you're thinking. Okay, so we had an extra 40 minutes that day. So what? So what? Well, we must remember that Yahweh's calendar is both a sun, uh, is both the sun and the moon. It makes no mention of the moon here, as such was the case in Joshua 10:12, speaking of Joshua's long day when the sun and moon both stood still, which is a whole other subject in itself. Here it only speaks of the sun's position changing 10 degrees, which we now know was 40 minutes. The moon never changed its course. It just continued on its daily orbit as it always had. It can easily be seen here that this would have altered the relationship of time between the sun and moon orbits by 40 minutes. However, although it has only changed once every, uh, each and every day since that time, the 40-minute alteration is still evident. In other words, the next day after this happened, the sun and moon orbit relationships were still altered by 40 minutes. The day after that, there was still an alternation of alteration of 40 minutes. Months and years after that, yep, still 40 minutes difference from the original orbit. The 40-minute alteration between the relationship of the sun and the moon has continued from that day until present time. And our view of this delicate relationship is what it looks like after this change occurred. What we must understand is this was a one-time event which instituted a change that is evident and viewable from Earth every day since then. We must think about how the sun and moon have a delicate relationship between one another on their daily orbit cycles. If a change is made to the sun, it will affect the phases of the moon. As the moon's phases are dependent upon its position in relationship to the sun, the moon's phases change from a completely dark moon uh, at the beginning of the month and phase all the way through the last waning sliver at the end of the month. If a change is made to the sun, then this will also make a change in the monthly cycle of the moon. Okay, maybe we'll just stop for a minute. Uh, anybody have a comment? Uh, I don't know if we're ready to answer any questions right now, but does anybody have a comment so far? about the 40-minute change uh, with the 10 degrees on the sundial. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll mention a few things. Um, he makes some assumptions here, which are, are fine for, for the discussion, which we're going to continue with. Um, he, he moves to, to making the, step, uh, the statement about steps and hours. Uh, I actually looked up the word in Hebrew, and it's ma'alah. Uh, and studying that word, I find out that the ma means from, and Allah actually means the rising, which is very interesting. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but <laughs> there may be going on more in the, in the passage than even he uh, is uh, uh, dealing with there. The, the second thing I want to make a statement of is he, he uh, views this from the perspective that Yahweh gave uh, Hezekiah uh, the... Um, option of which way the day the sundial would move and then he assumes that it happened instantly within seconds or minutes after that was said i'm not sure we know that it could have been days hours um so um you know it could have been the next day and therefore it could have gone either way anyway he has some assumptions in his discussion which are, are worth thinking about but we'll okay. allow him those We'll allow him those positions, those thoughts, and we'll continue with uh, hearing um, how he resolves that. Yeah, because that is interesting, Brother Pete, because if Hezekiah was praying out by the sundial, he would have seen the 10-degree change then, but maybe he was in his room uh, praying and asking for miracles, and then the, he saw the sundial change later that day or the next day. That's interesting. Um, we tend to think of a sundial also as that little round disc with a little pointer on it. Uh, in ancient times, they, uh, particularly a nation, a king, 
often would have a whole group of men who did the observing. You know, that's what they're doing. They're clock readers. And uh, some of these sundials were huge. Um, they would have been made uh, very, very large. Uh, I remember seeing some pictures. You know, we think of something called an observatory, and we think of a telescope. But the ancient observatories didn't have uh, uh, any lenses, so they had these large-scale um, uh, curved surfaces, and they had uh, ropes with a device in the middle that cast a shadow down on the curve. Um, and uh, uh, I remember seeing some uh, pictures of them. They were hundreds of feet across and high. Oh. Okay, well, and it's going to mention this in the article, but uh, we don't know if the change exactly happened at the time of Hezekiah, but we do know he was around during the 700 B.C., and it was during the early 700s that the whole world still all had 30-day calendars. So it was at that time, somewhere there close to Hezekiah, that all the calendars had that little dent, that little problem with 29 days every other month. So uh, it's possible it happened with the sundial changing 10 degrees. That's what we're kind of discussing. I think he's going to go into that, of course. And uh, I guess we'll go forward unless there's another comment. How did the moon cycle change? As we have now discovered, this one-time event has had an effect every day since then. What kind of change occurred and what effect would the 40-minute difference between the relationship of the sun and moon cause? The moon's original cycle. Anyone who has read and studied Yahweh's word knows that originally Yahweh's calendar always had 30 days in each month. One prime example of this is located in Bereshit, that is Genesis 7:11. In the 600th year of Noah's Chaim, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the foundations of the great deep broken up and the windows of the Shamaim, that is the heavens, were opened. And then in Barashit uh, 8.3, and the Maim, that is the waters, returned from off the earth continually, and after the end of the hun of 150 days, the Maim were abated, that is the waters, and the Tayah Ark, that is the Ark, rested in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. Here it is stated in verse 711 that the rain began to fall on the second month, on the 17th day. Now as we read in verse 83, the ark came back to rest on Mount Ararat on the seventh month and the 17th day. Let's count, uh, let's count beginning on from the second month, 17th day, to the third month, 17th day, one month. And he has a list here where he shows you each month to the 17th day. So we have one month, two months, three months, four months uh, total, or five months total. All right, Excuse so we have five months total. Also, as we read in Bautasheet, that is Genesis 8.3, this same period of time was also called 150 days. Now, if we take 150 days and divide it by the five months, we get 30. This tells us that there were 30 days in each month in the days of Noah, that is, Noah. There are, as many, there are many other examples in Scripture where we can find that the months all contain 30 days, such as all prophetic times of days and years, were given in 30-day month periods, such as in Daniel. It speaks of 1,260 days, also being three and a half years. 1,260 divided by three and a half is 360 days per year. 360 divided by the 12 months comes out with 30 days each month. Right, and if you've ever been to a prophecy seminar or anything, 
uh, or you study of scripture yourself, hopefully, you know all those are divided by 30. And if you uh, know anybody that went to seminary, um, they say all of those months are divided by 30 because Israel had a 30-day calendar. So I love it when they say that, but then they uh, deny that that calendar is still in the heavens today. But they say Israel had a 30-day calendar, so that's why prophecy is 30 days. And then also he gave the scripture there of Noah uh, that 150 days equals 30 days in every month then. So, any comments about 30-day month? It would be really nice when it gets fixed again. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, we'll go forward a little more. The moon's cycle today. Now, let's fast forward to present day. Today we know that the moon has a monthly cycle of only 29 and a half days. This is from one Rosh Kodesh, that is dark moon, new moon, to the next. We know these times by reading Yahweh's two witnesses. They speak to us the length of the months, weeks, days, and years. Tahalim, 1914. I'm a little confused. My remembrance is tell. I'm not sure what passage that is. Yeah, I think that Psalms, and I knew that verse at the beginning was Kings. I knew the Kings verse, but the <laughs> seeing it in Hebrew really threw me off. But this is <laughs> Psalms 19, 1 to 14. There we go. Um, verse 1, quote, The Shema'im declare the Tephaleth of El, Yahweh, and the expanse shows his handiwork. Day-to-day -day utter speech, and night-to-night -night reveals the hot, that is, knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. End quote. Of course, anyone knows we are not to observe a half-day, even though the moon has a 29-and-a-half-day cycle in the present time. As the sun controls when the day begins and ends, sunset the sunset is a day. The moon only controls when the month begins, and in return it also controls how long a month is. As when the next month begins, the last month has ended. We do not choose the length of the month. Every month will contain either 29 or 30 days. It will never go over 30. Because of these 29 days, Day months, one additional month is created by the turn of the year approximately every three years. Yahweh does not tell us to keep his calendar without a witness of how the days, weeks, months, and years are constructed. Plus, he must tell us how it is to be read and kept. His calendar, including the 29-day month, 30-day month, and the 13th month, but 13th month must all be in his word so that we can understand fully how to keep his appointed times which are only kept by his calendar and not man's okay well any comments anybody about uh, the calendar in the heaven that he expects us to understand it but he knows there's a dent because if this happened in the 700s B.C., when Yeshua was here, there was a 29.5-day month when he was here, and he had to deal with it, too. So uh, any comments so far? I'm going to try to answer questions later, but uh, for the sake of time, we'll go with comments right now. Okay, we'll just go a little further. We don't have to read the whole article, uh, but we'll go ahead some more. Yeah. What is the result of Hezekiah's 40-minute or 10-degree change made between the relationship of the sun and the moon? Now that we've shown that the original calendar had 30 days every month and only 12 months per year, whereas today there are some months with only 29 days and others with 30, and then the 13th month is seen approximately every three years. Can we find when this change occurred in Yahweh's word? 
what was the effect when Yahweh's changed Yahweh changed the son's position as an oath that is signed to Yah Hezekiah to cause the sundial shadow to return ten degrees. Could these two completely different subjects, Hezekiah's sundial and the moon's twenty nine and a half dial half day cycle be related? Well, let's calculate. For those who aren't math majors, grab your calculators and follow along. Fact, the 10 degrees oath sign to Hezekiah caused a 40 minute time difference between the position of the sun in relation to the moon. This 40 minute difference is true every day since that time. So he has 40, day, 40 minutes per day times 30 days equal 1,200 minutes difference per month. 1,200 minutes per month times 12 months is 14,400 minutes difference per year. 14,400 times three years is 43,200 minutes difference in three years. So how many hours are we talking about? That 43,200 minutes divided by 60 is 720 hours lost in three years' time. How many days is this? 720 hours divided by 24 hours in a day is equal to 30 days. That is, the 13th month that occurs every three years. Okay, so sometimes we have a question, why is there a 13th month? Because we're in the 29 and a half days. Hezekiah's sign. As we've already read, read, before this time in Hezekiah's life, and all the way back to the creation of, of Adam, there were always 30 days in every month. But when Yahweh returned the, returned the sundial backwards 10 degrees as a sign to Hezekiah, this caused an alteration of time between the relationship of the sun and the moon, which are Yahweh's timepieces. This alteration caused the 29-day month to be born, which occurs about six times a year. In turn, the shortened 29-day month also caused the 13th month to be born approximately every three years. The 13th month is needed for keeping the alignment of the feast days with the correct seasons. Right. And for example, um, last year we had Passover in March and um, we had 12 months. But this coming year we will have a 13th uh, month and uh, Passover will be in April. That's what we're expecting. So it keeps you caught up so that you're not in the middle of the winter. By keeping with 12 months, you'll eventually be in the middle of the winter for Passover. And so it keeps you in tune with the seasons. Amen. Further explanations. Why the sun's position much, must have changed and not the earth's rotating backwards. Now what I said earlier that I would explain a few things in detail. First I mentioned that for the shadow of the sun tile to return backwards 10 degrees, that this must be the sun's position moving and not the earth rotating backwards. If both the sun and moon moved, or earth rotated backwards, whichever view, then there would be no change in the months. If both timepieces, sun and moon, both move backwards together, then there would be no change in their relationship. Only the length of that day would be 40 minutes longer. As was the case in Yehoshua's long day, Joshua's long day, the sun and moon both stood still. Their relationship between each other did not change. The only thing that happened was a long day until the battle had ended. For the 10 degrees to make a change, it would only have been the sun moving backwards. The moon must have stayed in its original course. This is the only way that it could have changed the relationship between the sun and the moon which in turn changed the length of the total phases uh, from one new moon to the next new moon, which controls the length of the months. 
And if both the sun and moon didn't change or move, both but the earth rotated backwards, this also could not explain a change in the months either, as the relationship between sun and moon would still be unchanged. Just someone viewing them from earth would have seen them move backwards, and again, it would have only made that day 10 degrees or 40 minutes longer. But it wouldn't have changed the months, as the moon's phases and times would still have been the same. Since the moon is only dependent upon the sun for the timing of its phases and not Earth. Neither one of these th theories above can explain why we have a 29 day month and a 13th month approximately every three years. If one of these two theories were true, we should still have 30 days every month and only 12 months every year without change. Since we don't, or since we do not, we instead have the 29-day months and the 13th month, as I said earlier. This change must be in Yahweh's word, as, uh, as it is part of his calendar in which he has commanded us to follow. Okay, so um, we're going um, to, here it says, Why did Yahuwah choose how many degrees and not Hezekiah? That's right, because he gave him a choice, 10 degrees forward and 10 degrees back. Uh, that's interesting, too. I guess I hadn't really thought about it, but he didn't just let Hezekiah just come up with the number. He gave him a choice, uh, like it says in uh, 2 Kings 29, and... You know, all these words are in Hebrew that this white writer wrote, so it's a little more confusing. So, uh, Yah said, this is a sign you have of Yahweh that Yahuwah will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forth 10 degrees or back 10 degrees? So he gave him the choice. He didn't let him decide. Here we see that Yahweh gave Hezekiah the choice of 10 degrees, forward or backwards. But why did Yahweh choose how many degrees and not let Hezekiah? Because no man, or Satan, can change Yahweh's set-apart uh, set times, which are dictated by his calendar. In addition, if Yahweh had let Hezekiah choose the number of degrees, we as mankind like to see particular and fantastic miracles, and as such, Hezekiah might have chosen 30 or 40 degrees. What would have, uh, what that, excuse me, what would that have done to the calendar if a, cha if a change was made which caused more than one day's loss in any month? We would lose the last Sabbath of that month. As the last Sabbath is 29th of that month. As it stands now, only the 30th day, which is preparation for Rosh Kodesh, or the new moon, is lost in some months. If we had lost two days instead of one, then we would lose both the 30th and the 29th day Sabbath, therefore destroying the seven-day weekly cycle which Yahweh instituted in Bereshit, that is Genesis 1. Note that Rosh Kodesh begins and is the anchor for the month, and is not included in the six-day work week, nor is Rosh Kodesh a Shabbat, which must be followed, which must follow the six-day work week. For more info on this subject, go to, and he has a link there. Yeah, and we did a YouTube, too, that you can look up about the three kinds of days, and that's kind of what he's explaining there, the new moon day. Oh, I'm hearing oh, a little echo. echo. Somebody needs Somebody to mute their, their computer. And we're just a little bit more of reading. But that was interesting to me. If he would have chose uh, 29 forward, we'd have still had um, there. I think that that's whoever it was muted the computer. We would have still had a Sabbath, the 29th day, but um, with going backwards, it still kept us with uh, New Moon Day, but uh, 
sometimes we have a one new moon day and sometimes two. So that is an interesting thought, too. Anybody have any comments? Okay, we'll go forward. Further proof from another witness. Okay, there is even more evidence and proof. Firstly, when Yahweh revealed this to me, I was working on a complete scriptural chronological timeline. On this scriptural timeline, I can prove that when Hezekiah lived and was healed, and was healed, it is only stated in history on the Roman calendar years as the 8th century B.C. The 8th century B.C., of course, being 7... 99 B.C. to 700 B.C. What does that prove? Let's move to history. Note, history is, is, is a good witness, but only as a third or fourth witness to what we can already show in Scripture when using it to back up the scriptural point. It is known by many historians and is well documented in many historical texts uh, that in... Uh, that in what they call the 8th century B.C., there was a major change in the calendars. And I'm not just talking about Israel. I'm talking about many different and unrelated cultures worldwide, including, but not limited to, Chinese, Aztec, Greece, Babylonian, Egyptians, early Roman, and many others. Before this change, all of these different widely scattered cultures is recorded as using a 360-day, 12-month year, 30-day month calendar. Then suddenly, in the 8th century, these, calendar, these cultures, who all used a solar-only yearly calendar, had too many days in their year. They suddenly had five days extra each year. All these cultures made up myths and stories about how the gods battled and the moon lost and the sun won the, sun won the battle. So the sun gained an extra five days, and so on. They all discarded their old 360-day calendars as they followed the solar year. Also, in all these cultures, a 30-day month was written as normal, whole, complete, good, full, lucky, and so on. The months with 29 were recorded as sick, incomplete, hollow, defective, lacking, unlack, unlucky, deficient, and more. You can find this information in historical research on your own, but I will list the link uh, to one site which I found there that gives a great overview of several cultures, and link follows. Note, this site also mentions a few cultures that had 29 and 30 day months prior to the 8th century BC. The reason for this is they were looking for the first visible crescent to begin the moon, which even today could be anywhere from one to three days after the true Rosh Kadesh or new moon, even in good weather with clear skies. Okay, well, maybe just for a second. Um, so he just went through all the, I guess I can go back there, how all the world in the, in the 8th century with the 700... 799 was affected by a calendar change. Something happened. There was, they say with their mythology, there was war between sun and moon, and the sun won. There's five extra days. But uh, all the calendars that were all 30-day months until then uh, all made a change in that century. So is it possible it was Hezekiah's sundial? Okay, we're on the last page here. Uh, hi, Barb. This is Gail. Oh, hi, Gail. Hey, um, I, I have a, a comment. Um, as Peter uh, is getting ready to read the 10 degrees oat sign to Israel, um, <clears throat> a couple of pages back he read that also. Now, that sign, that oat, is also associated in Hezekiah, um, um, that is um, uh, Hezekiah. Hold on, just a minute. Um, that is in Second uh, Kings nineteen twenty nine and Second Kings 
28 and 2 Kings 20, verse 9. And that is Strong's number 0226. That sign that it's referring to there, that oh, that sign is the olive top. It goes back to Genesis. Genesis Bereshit 116, where the olive top and it says, and and make and and made Elohim at olive top sign out two great lights. The greater et alav tav ot sign, light to rule the day, and et alav tav sign ot, the lesser light to rule the night, et sign ot alav tav, the stars. So I just wanted to bring that out, that all three verses are pointing right back to Bereshit, the beginning, and it is the alav tav it is Yahuwah. It is his mark, sign, and seal. Well, thank you, Gail. That's really interesting. It all points right back to um, the olive top, his sign and seal. Thank you. Okay, we'll go a little bit more. And uh, did someone have a comment about what Gail said or where we're at right now? Okay, we'll just read this last page. The ten degree, oat or sign to Israel. Just like the, the sign given to Noah that Yahweh would never destroy the earth by water again, he set a rainbow as a visual sign of his promise to Noah and to every generation who has lived since that time. Even to this generation in the present day, we still can see the sign of Yahweh's promise is rainbow in the clouds. The sign given to Hezekiah works the same way. It was a sign to him that he would be healed and would come to the temple on the third day. Well, the 29-day the twenty-nine day month and the 13th month that it creates approximately every three years are also a sign to every generation since that day, especially to this generation, that Israel would be healed that Israel would be healed and made whole and on the third day from that day, from that time, which is the beginning of the seventh day millennium when Yeshua returns, just like Hezekiah will go to the temple and worship Yahweh. These signs are about Yahweh's promises and were set in place as a remembrance to the future generations of Israel. Yahweh has not changed. Changed His Torah is still in force, and so are his promises and signs that he has given to Israel for these last days. As we, the people of Israel, begin to gather up, returning to the ancient paths and commands of Yahweh, preparing to return to Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, and for the soon coming return of Yeshua, Malek, king of Israel. Wow, that is really interesting. I liked how that all tied in with um, the time that we're living in, that the sign for us is going to be a sign of healing, uh, healing our calendar, healing uh, Israel in the, on the third day. That's just really is interesting. Um, he set in place for remembrance for us especially for this generation. So that is really awesome. Any comments about that? Instead of I was just thinking, why is it why is it wrong? Why can't it be perfect? It's so hard to explain to people. They always want to know, why is it 29 or 30? Why do we have that big dent in the calendar? But uh, actually, it's a sign for us. And I never thought about it that way before. Yes, and I think it's a sign for us, this is Susan, I think it's a sign for us, it's also very wise, because in the last generation you will have those that do not want to believe the signs and those that do want to believe the signs, and those that choose to doubt will make that a stumbling point, and yet those of us who choose to believe 
we'll just say, well, we're just we're just going to do the best we can, and he'll clean it up. He'll clean it up one of these days, and now we know when the third day. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. thank you, Susan. And thank you, Gail, for bringing out the olive cob, how it's all tied in here with the sign. Way back to Genesis with the sun, moon, and stars, our calendar. Well, I also want to bring out, too, in that um, Genesis, I forgot to say, uh, Genesis 1.16, uh, the last two olive tavs have a vav uh, attached to it. Uh, it doesn't diminish the olive and the tav um, being uh, connected to Yahuwah because he is the tent peg, he is the nail. Uh, it's also referred to as a hook and a bridge. And it also refers to man. So there is a connection, a hook, a bridge um, for man um, and this nail to the olive tav and to the timing of the seasons. And especially for this generation, you're right, I hadn't really thought about it as um, a sign for the future. Um, But... um, you know, it is a sign for these last days that Yahuwah is making a bridge in the highway of the desert to return. That's really beautiful, Gail. So I think, on just a minute, on that note, I think I'm going to close the recording, and then for those of you that are here, we'll stay around for more conversation about the Father's Calendar. And for those of you that were listening, you can go to the website and read the complete article, which we just did today, but at your own time, uh, on, in the article section of the website. So, shalom, shalom. Thank you, everyone that commented, and those of you that are here, please stay.